Hey there, welcome to Dating Skills Podcast, episode 65 on polyamory. I'm going to try a little experiment for the next few weeks. I'm going to bring up some interesting facts from research studies at the beginning of the podcast on sexuality, dating, and relationships to get a a bit of an idea of what the scientific world is saying most recently about all of this. If you'd like me to keep doing this, let me know in the comments for the episode and I'll keep doing it. So today it's a couple of studies done by an evolutionary psychologist named Nigel Barber, PhD, in 2008. What he saw is that some level of polyamory is observed in virtually every society, even if it's covertly done, right? So not people aren't telling each other about it, but less so in Western countries like the US and those in the European Union. In most poor countries, in fact, one sixth of women share their husbands that are in polyamorous relationships. And what what the study saw was that polyamory increased where there was a scarcity of males in the population and where some of the men could monopolize the wealth more. So basically you have some men which are richer than the rest of the men and where there's not many men. So there's less men to go around and there's a lot of benefit to going with some men versus others. So it kind of makes a bit of sense there. An interesting fact about it was that these polyamorous women also cared a lot more about physical attractiveness and had a higher sex drive, so they preferred physically attractive men more so than in other countries. Today we're talking about polyamory, also known today as open relationships, multiple long-term relationships, MLTRs, and more generally as having casual partners known as FBs. That's friend with benefits or fuck buddies. If you've never thought about why you are monogamous, that means you like to date exclusively, or why you are polyamorous, aka you like to date multiple people, then this is an episode for you. Our sexual and relationship choices are just that. But often today, we don't think about this choice. We just take what cultural society hands to us and we run with it. And that can depend on where you grew up, who your friends are, where you've been influenced by your parents and so on. Up until the age of 28, I was monogamous without ever thinking about it once. It was just something I did. Then I chose to live polyamorously to explore relationships for many, many years. And that period was extremely rewarding for me. But later again, I changed my mind and I chose to become monogamous again. These were all choices I made after the age of 28 and, you know, they served me well. What do you choose? Do you know why? Does it make you happier, more satisfied? Does it contribute to your life or does it take away from it? I believe that everyone should make this choice for themselves. They should think about this and make this choice consciously and understand how it contributes or takes away from their life in general and thus makes you happier, more satisfied or not. So today we're diving in deep to explore polyamory, what it means, the upsides and downsides to find out if it's something that may be right or not right for you. One book that always gets brought up on the subject of polyamory is The Ethical Slut. And it first went into print in 1997. It's written by Janet W. Hardy and Dossie Easton. It has sold nearly 150,000 copies since then. Janet Hardy, one of the co-authors, has spent 30 years exploring and educating about sexuality. And she's looked at many types of polyamory, inside marriage, outside marriage, between friends, polyamorous groups, bisexuality, the BDSM community, vanilla sex, tantric sex, and so on and so on. She has 11 books published on the topic, and she's working on her 12th right now. Janet has traveled the world as a speaker and teacher at conferences over the years, has appeared in five documentary films on sex and polyamory, many television shows, and countless radio shows. In short, she's been one of the best-known names in polyamory education and advice for over 20 years. So it's awesome to have her on the show to introduce this topic for the first time. As usual, to get all the show notes, to get the transcript, to get the download MP free of the show, and let me know your thoughts in the comments, go to datingskillsreview.com slash DSP65. I'm Angel Donovan, and this is the Dating Skills Podcast. This is a 14-year ongoing mission to discover the truth about what works in dating, sex, and relationships to become a better man. Join me as I leave no stone unturned. Chase down every expert, role model, and mentor with insights to get us to that goal as fast as possible. This show is about bringing you the best of that information. 
so that you can take it in and change your life for the better, step by step, episode by episode. Anir, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's great to have you here. Uh, delighted to be here. Great. What I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about your background so the audience can understand where you're coming from. And you've had a very interesting life from a polyamory and all of that aspect. So could you talk a little bit about how did this all happen? The full bio, I imagine it's pretty long, but a brief summary, how did you get into it and how did you start educating about it? And Well, in terms of polyamory, I came of age in the late 60s and early 70s when uh, a lot of experimentation with uh, alternatives to monogamy. Moreover, I was at UC Santa Cruz, which is still kind of a hotbed of experimentation. So during my late teens and early adulthood, I was very happily sort of opening myself up sexually and having sex wherever it looked good to me. And then I met this guy, and we fell in love, and we sort of defaulted to monogamy because we didn't really think about it. At no point did someone say, okay, we're monogamous now. We just kind of were. Fast forward uh, 13 years, and here I am married and raising two kids and living in the suburbs. And slowly I started to look around me and go, this is not a choice I made was not a considered choice. It doesn't feel good. I don't like this. I was starting to come out into BDSM at the time, and that was not a good fit for that marriage. So I, the marriage ended, although it ended in a very friendly way. Once I was out of that marriage, I decided I was not going to promise monogamy to anybody again. And I haven't and won't. It's just not the way I want to live my life. So my next relationship after that was a very actively poly relationship in which both of us were seeing other people usually separately, occasionally together. It was great. It was awesome. I loved it. And that relationship ended too, although not for poly reasons, for other reasons. And I moved on and started teaching along with Dossi other people about how to lead an effectively poly life with having maximum fun and doing minimum harm. And we wrote the book in 1997 and did a second edition in 2009. It turned out to be a runaway hit. Now I travel the world teaching poly stuff, and Dossie does too. Um, It's awesome. (laughs) It's great. Your book is like The Ethical Slut is referenced always. Whenever the topic of multiple long-term relationships or multiple relationships or polyamory comes up, it's it's hard to escape that book coming up. Yeah, (laughs) it it is, and we love it that way. We did not expect it. I think we hit that it is. Uh, Got very lucky in terms of sort of catching the wave as it was just starting to crest and riding the wave. So our timing was great. The title did us a lot of favors, although we were terrified of it in the beginning. It just kind of caught fire. We had no idea it was going to do that, although we're thrilled that it did. Yeah, that's great. So how old are you now and where did you live? 59. Okay. And you're in Oregon, I think. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So are you in a relationship today? What's your kind of lifestyle like today? Um, Very, very quiet compared to my earlier wildness. I'm married to a bisexual man. Uh, We're both kind of bi. We're both kind of gender bent. And we're both kind of celibate these days. It's just where our lives have gone. Sex isn't very important to us right now because we both had an awful lot of it back in the day and kind of saw that elephant. And now we were very domestic. He's gotten involved in local politics. I sit home and go tappity-tap on the keyboard. For two people with as wild a background as us, we look very much like a middle-aged suburban couple. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's nice do you think it's uh, due to age and biology or it's due to your experience as you said you've kind of explored a lot of the topics pretty aggressively if you think about your whole life you've done a lot of different things I think it's both of those to some degree certainly my the, the pure raw libido is not what it once was but it's not like I never get horny I do however I have the solution to that problem at the end of my right arm so that's convenient it's partly that I had my journey, and I went where I wanted to go. And now I've been to the end of that journey, and I don't feel any pressing need to travel that road again. Life goes on, and you have to kind of stay open to what your life is telling you it wants to be at any given time. And that's kind of what's happening for me now. It could be that next week I'll wake up and want to be the sweetheart of the Seventh Fleet again. And that's cool, too. I've, I've built a life where I can certainly make that change if it's what presents itself. So far it hasn't, but it may. Great, great. So how many relationships have you had over your lifetime? And do you put those into different categories or how do you look at it? Well, yeah, you'd have to define relationship first. And that's that's a really interesting problem. If you mean how many lovers have I lived with, 
uh, three. However, I would certainly count my relationship with Dossie, my co-author, as a long-term and very dear relationship in spite of the fact that we've never lived together. We've been lovers off and on for nearly 30 years now. We've created five books together. It's a terribly important relationship. And so the minute you start counting relationships as the ones that are about living together and sharing a joint checking account, then right away you start leaving out so important a relationship as that. So when you start counting people that I've loved um, a lot more, some of them I've loved for two hours, (laughs) some of them I've loved for 10 years, I don't know where to, to define the edges of your question. Right, right. Do you make a difference between the kind of love chemistry versus the kind of longer term love? How do you look at Not so much anymore. Uh, The longer I spend my life writing about things like sex and love, the harder problem I have drawing the lines between them. Certainly, the kind of love that you have when you've been through thick and thin with someone that doesn't necessarily have that sharp edge of excitement and lust to it is different than what you feel towards someone that you're just getting to know. But Each of them has some of the other in it, and when I start thinking about the kinds of love I have with uh, someone I've lived with for a long time and that we've been through problems and difficulties and bad death and all the rest of it, it feels like the love I might have for a dear friend, and it's hard for me to tell the difference anymore. Yes, that's a great perspective you're giving us there. So... Obviously, you've been through the polyamory community and you know, you've, had, you've had extensive experience in writing about it. So how do you look at it? For people basically who haven't been exposed at all to the polyamory communities, do you put it into different categories, different communities? If you're looking at the whole thing, what kind of opportunities or what kind of background is there to all of this? Well, there's as many different ways to do poly as there are people doing poly, really. There, there are folks who are in the sort of long-term multi-partner relationship that looks pretty much like a marriage, only it has more than two people in it. So you have three or four people or more, I suppose, who are all under the same roof, raising their children if they have any together, sharing expenses, things like that. That's one model. Another is what's probably the commonest model, which is a core couple with outside lovers. There are circles of, of sexual friends who all know each other and None of them live together, but they're all friends in a sexual way. There's any number of ways to do it. And I'm not big into probably getting it by now, drawing lines between things, taxonomizing things. A lot of people like to make a lot of rules about, well, this is polyamory and this is open relationships and this is polyfuckery and this is... uh, And not so much. I'm I'm not so much into grouping things together and putting labels on them because I'm not sure of a reason for it. What there is is what, when I meet someone new, what might develop between us. And if I try to force that into a model, then I'm not really opening myself to the possibility. Right, right. So one way I think about this is like some of these communities like ESM, BDSM, Lever, and so on, in a way they can be gateways into polyamory, I think. Absolutely. People are interested in different types of sex. So that kind of drives them to go and look for this stuff. And then they get slowly involved in polyamory what kind of gateways have you seen or are you going to say again like there's many millions of ways but are there kind of like main ways that people get involved in this and get introduced to it any place where people like to think about alternative realities you're likely to find a poly community which is why we see so much overlap between the poly world and say the uh, science fiction world the creative anachronism world the ren fairs and so on those are kind of hotbeds of polyamory BDSM certainly is because once you start questioning what sex is, which is BDSM may not include genital sex, but it's certainly erotic, if not sexual. And when you find out that you don't know what the edges of sex are, then whether you like it or not, you have to start negotiating the boundaries of poly. Likewise, Tantra uh, has a fair amount of overlap with poly for the same reason. Once you've reached orgasm by breathing with someone, you kind of get it very viscerally that you have no idea what sex is or isn't. And when you have to start negotiating things like, is it okay if I go breathe with John, then that's poly. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen it change over time? You were talking about in the 70s, obviously, that was a very specific time period. Yes. I think what we're doing in these times is, you know, back in the 70s, I think the reason people tried to do free love and didn't stick with it is because there were very few models. 
if you're in a monogamous relationship and you run into difficulties, there's a therapist in every town, there's a bookstore on every corner with centuries of received wisdom about how to keep a monogamous relationship going. Before our book, uh, there was very little about how to keep a non-monogamous relationship going. These days, there's a lot more books, many more books. Uh, there's poly group meetups and groups and support. There are websites. There's all this support for people who are trying to make their poly relationship work. And that's important to have role models, to have guidelines, to have wisdom from people who have tried it and failed, wisdom from people who have tried it and succeeded, how it worked for them. Um, that's what helps when you're in tough times. Yeah. And there's a lot of discussion online now with the internet. Things have changed a lot in terms of how open things are. Yeah, absolutely. Many more people are out as being poly than have ever been before. And the, yeah. the social consequences, there are still plenty of social consequences, don't get me wrong, but they are not nearly as intense as they were when we wrote the first edition back in 1997. Yeah, that's an important point that I guess you must have got some feedback about it and it was probably a bit more shocking at the time. Um, but is it a lot more widely accepted these days and you don't get negative feedback so much? Or Well, we still get plenty of negative feedback. Uh, a lot of people are still very hostile toward Polly, but it isn't the way it was in 1997, for sure. When we first did the book, uh, we were doing a lot of radio talk shows and people were really angry. We were st sort of startled. We'd already written two SM books, and we thought after writing about something as outrageous as SM, writing about polyamory would be much milder. No, people got angry in ways we had never encountered before with the SM book. It seemed to people took it a lot more personally. Is this mostly religion-driven, or is it more general? I, certainly, uh, religion plays a role, but I don't think it's the primary driver of the anger that we encountered. I have to think, based on just sort of my read of uh, some of the anger I've received, is if I were getting on in my life and I had been in a monogamous relationship that was not very happy for a very long time and nobody had ever told me that there were any other options, and then this broad came on the radio and said, no, you don't have to be monogamous. Uh, it works fine other ways, too. I would be furious. And the person that I would be furious toward would not necessarily be the one who had told me that monogamy was my only option. I would be furious at the woman who had upset my worldview. That's kind of my guess about why people were as upset as they were. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. Talking a bit more in terms of practicality here, if someone, they're listening to this and they're interested in learning about this, they've been monogamous for a long while and a bit like you, maybe they've had some doubts um, about it being the right kind of lifestyle for them. What kind of practical things would you say they should do to reach out and get involved somewhere and like reach out to people? Are there easy steps they can take to get involved in this? Um, certainly starting with some of the good books out there would be a good jumping off place just to get kind of the values and principles and vocabulary. Not just ours. Ours is lovely, but there's Tristan Tarmino's opening up. I just wrote the foreword for a brand new one called More Than Two. There's a new book of interviews with different poly people, which would be great for giving someone who is new an idea of what the possibilities are. It's called The Polyamorists Next Door. There's a lot of poly literature out there that would be a great place to start and just kind of see where or if you might fit in the world of poly. And then um, many towns and cities have a munch now, which is a social gathering of people with an interest in poly with no expectation of any interaction beyond the social. You can just go and have a meal and meet other poly people and chat, which is great. None of this existed back when I first came into poly. So to find that, would you Google polyamory munch and then your city name, like San Diego or whatever? Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Google the name of your town or the nearest town of any size and polyamory and much and see what turns up. Failing that, try polyamory support with the name of your town. See what there is in that regard. Here in Eugene, which is a small city, I think it's about 150,000 people, there's a polyamory discussion group that's hosted by one of the local poly families. I guess some people would be kind of nervous about what it means because sometimes they maybe compare it to swinging. You hear about the swinging clubs and things like that. Is one of these munches very different to that? Like, Yeah, that's a good thing to emphasize. Nobody is going to touch you without your consent at a poly support group meeting or a poly munch. People are not going to be groping each other or anything like that. It's a 
intended to be a place for new people to be safe. It will be talking and eating. Uh, that's about it. So in terms of common social rules or common culture, you know, you're talking a, little, a bit about the vocabulary and the rules and you're talking about safety just now. What kind of polyamory behaviors are there that are quite typical now? Lots and lots and lots of processing and discussion and communication is absolutely enormous in poly. When monogamous people get together, they tend to fall back, as my first partner and I did, on this well-established social custom around monogamy. Poly people don't have that, which is actually one of the good things about being poly, is that you've got to get it out on the table and talk about it. Monogamous people, I think, run into problems all the time, assuming that both partners in the relationship mean the same thing when they say monogamy. Then all of a sudden, they run into problems with say, phone sex or looking at porn or any one of the things that one person might define as part of a monogamous agreement and the other might not. In poly, we have to talk about all of that. We have to get it out on the table because it's going to come up and we have to deal with it. We don't get to assume anything in poly. The other thing that is normal in poly, I think, is recovering from misunderstandings because no relationship can cover all the possibilities. There's always going to be stuff that sneaks through that's going to turn out that one person feels bad about and that you've got to pull back from that. You've got to find a way through it if you expect to hold the relationship together. Great. So how early are you talking about these discussions people have? So, right, for instance, if you meet someone who's polyamorous, um, how's that topic typically going to get introduced to you? Or how would you, if you are polyamorous, how would you think it's appropriate also to introduce it to someone else? That's one of the questions that poly people chew on endlessly is when do you bring up the possibility of poly? And everybody has a slightly different answer. There seems to be consensus that before clothes come off, before anybody starts heading for a bed, this one has to come out on the table. It's not something that comes up very often for me. In fact, it's not something that comes up ever for me. because I've got my name on the cover of the freaking book. <laughs> pretty much I'm out before I step in the room. But for people who do not have their names on the covers of books, the people I talk to seem to say, maybe not in the first conversation or the first date, but by the second. You don't want anybody to build up hopes or expectations of an exclusive relationship before you've had that conversation. You have to give them the freedom to say, no, that's not for me, and step away before they get emotionally involved. So whatever that looks like in your own relationship. Is there any way to tell if someone's polyamorous? Are there any signs like people could... No, there's been attempts at coming up with a little symbol that people can wear. Uh -huh. Some groups use a, a little parrot, you know, poly the parrot. But I don't think they're well recognized anywhere. It's not like being able to wear a rainbow flag or even a, a BDSM symbol. Uh, there is no universally recognized poly symbol. But as you're saying, I think, I mean, this is what I've seen a little bit. If they're more sexually adventurous, they're more likely to be within that world. So if you're talking about sexual topics and so on, and they seem very open and very free about it and had a variety of experiences, maybe you could think, oh, maybe this is a polyamorous person. They may not, in fact, be a polyamorous person, but they're not someone who's going to slap you when you say you're polyamorous. If they're open about other kinds of alternative sexualities and sex in general, they're certainly likely to be aware of poly and not judgmental about it, even if they've decided it's not for them. You were just talking about recovering from misunderstandings. What are the typical misunderstandings that come up in these relationships? Um, it's usually, but I thought we had agreed on X. No, I didn't get that. I thought our agreement said Y. Nobody is a perfect communicator. Communication is imprecise. Um, and so... A common one, a lot of poly people, uh, novice poly people, start with an expectation that it's going to be just about sex, that it's okay to have sex with other people, but you don't get to get emotionally involved with them. That's not a, an agreement Dossie and I suggest. We think that it's going to happen sooner or later. And in fact, closing yourself off to the possibility of emotional involvement is not a way I want to move through my life. And probably you don't either. But it does happen, and one person thinks that the relationship is going to be casual and a fling, and then it turns out not to be, and the person who thought whose expectation was of the fling begins to get insecure because it's turning into more than that, and then there's work to be done. Yeah. In your book, you talk a lot about insecurity as opposed to jealousy, I found. 
our feeling about jealousy is that people talk about jealousy as that we're a monolithic emotion, that all jealousy is the same. Um, that's not what our experience has been. For some people, jealousy is insecurity. For other people, it's sort of territoriality and possessiveness. For other people, it might be um, fear of loss or sort of anticipatory grief. Any given person can know what jealousy feels like to them. And if you try to treat territoriality as a or insecurity, it's not going to work very well. So part of the process of experiencing jealousy is kind of teasing it apart and seeing what it is that you're angry or sad or afraid about and then looking more directly at that rather than just saying, I'm jealous. Jealousy is basically a projected emotion. In monogamous culture, me saying I'm jealous means I want you to change your behavior. In poly, that's not the assumption. When I say I'm jealous, it's mine to figure out what to do about, possibly with your help. I can ask for help, certainly. But it's not usually considered okay to ask someone to stop doing the thing that triggered the jealousy because that's sort of denying yourself a chance to learn from it and get stronger and move on. That brings up the kind of question, is this nature or nurture? Like, are people kind of destined biologically because that's kind of the way they're made up to be polyamorous? Or do you think it's this is really a journey and anyone can start it and anyone can get better at it and manage their emotions and change the way they feel about things over time? Or do you think it's got a lot to do with, from what you've seen, it's like as people come into this type of a relationship, then there's some things about them that aren't going to change that much and they're going to fit in somewhere better than other places. Maybe some of them they're going to find eventually that they can't deal with polyamory. Yeah. I'm not a big believer in biological predetermination. We, we don't even know the answer to that question about something as relatively straightforward as who you want to have sex with, uh, what gender. So we can't possibly know the answer to something as complicated as poly. I think that certainly people who are adventurous and not terribly risk aversive are more likely to be drawn to poly. Also, we see a lot of overlap between people who don't fit into conventional culture very well being drawn to poly. I think if conventional culture treats you very well, you know, if you're pretty and successful and popular and all of that, you don't have much reason to question it. And so poly may not be one of the things you're interested in because what you got is working fine. So what poly tends to draw is people for whom the mainstream isn't working very well, who want to look at other possibilities. I've noticed over time that there's uh, quite a few profiles on OkCupid. I'm guessing you know what OkCupid is. Oh, yeah. I'm there. Okay, great. So there's quite a few profiles on there where the women openly state that they're polyamorous and they're not interested in anything monogamous. And I've had many discussions and met some of these women. And the interesting thing I found about all of them is that they, they don't show pictures of their faces. They'll have discrete photos all the time. Well, there are two possible reasons for that probably more than two, but at least two that I can think of. One is that we do not live in a, a slut positive culture and they could be putting things that they value like their jobs or their kids at risk if they put their faces out there as being into poly. That's one possibility. The other is that they may not be conventionally attractive. As I say, poly tends to draw people for whom mainstream culture has not worked terribly well. So we do have more than our share of people who don't look like magazine models. I certainly don't. You've got my head shots. You know, I don't look like that kind of person. Dossie doesn't look like that kind of person. Most of the people I know in Polly do not look like that kind of person because we're happy people, contented people don't change the world. People who are unhappy with the way things are change the world. Right, right. I also found them quite kind of slow in the pace of conversation kind of careful. And I think it was, goes back to your first point about we're not in a slut positive culture. So there can be issues that come up in your work and, you know, other aspects of your life. So does that mean that are most people who are polyamorous, so they keep this as kind of like a, not a hidden part of themselves, but they, they don't bring it up unless they feel pretty comfortable about it? Um, I would say that there's a couple things going on there as well. One of them is what you say, self-protection in a world that can do damage to people who have unconventional sexualities. But I think part of it is that there's a lot of folks out there who think that because you say you're poly, that means that you are easy. That means that you want to have sex on the first date. Um, that means that you want to have group sex. And those are not necessarily the case. There are certainly people in the poly community who want those things, but not everybody by any means. Even if that's something that you do want, 
if you're a woman, you want to set the pace. You don't want to be pushed into it. The fact that she wants to have lots of wild sex with lots of interesting people does not necessarily mean she wants to have it with you now. <laughs> For the woman, I mean, it can be a safety issue as well? Yeah, absolutely. It absolutely is. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. The iTunes rank of the show is critical for getting the best guests onto the show. Ranking is largely determined by subscriber count, so more subscribers means better guests. Also, if you've already subscribed, then please leave a rating and review. This also helps increase the iTunes rank. Help me make this podcast the best resource possible for you. To subscribe or rate with one click, go to datingskillsreview.com slash iTunes. Does polyamory tend to draw a few wackos? Um, <laughs> I know that's not... All alternative sexualities draw their share of people who are not in it for what I would consider healthy reasons. I'm not going to go to wacko, but uh, people who are trying to work out scripts that have very little to do with building a healthy relationship or a bunch of healthy relationships. In poly, the way that often plays out is the set collector, the guy who, or woman who wants notches on the bedpost and who does not connect with lovers as people. It's a very singing kind of way to relate it. Right, so it's a very withdrawn, where it seems like most polyamorous people are more into in-depth relationships, like actually a lot more than most monogamous people tend to, because if you think about it, like, they don't talk about a lot of the issues that are under the skin in monogamous because they have this structure, which is just there, so they don't talk about it. But in, as you're saying, in polyamorous, it's a lot more varied, so... It's a bit of a more complex scenario, so you do have to, it forces you to talk about it. So it sounds like, from your perspective, a lot of the women involved, like, correct me, they're looking for at least some kind of emotional aspect. Yeah, if they weren't looking for an emotional connection, they wouldn't be on OkCupid okay promoting themselves as poly. They'd be in casual connections on Craigslist looking for one night stands, which is fine too. And I do know some women who work that one very happily and have their one-night stands, and I've been there myself, and there's nothing wrong with it. But it's not what a woman is saying when she's saying she's poly. They're sets that overlap a little bit, but they're not similar. They're, they're, they're not identical by any means. Great. An aspect of sexual safety is like STDs, sexual transmitted diseases, which, you know, if you're multiplying your partners by, I don't know, like however the number, you know, it multiplies your risk. So how do you deal with that in, in the community? There are different ways that different people deal with it. One is not to have high-risk sex with anybody uh, except perhaps uh, one core partner to do other things that people can do together sexually that have fewer risks of disease transmission. Could you give us a few concrete examples? Play with toys, play with hands, mutual masturbation, phone sex. Very, very difficult to get a disease doing phone sex. <laughs> I've never yet met a person who did it. Um, there are a lot of ways to have a fabulous time with sex without putting tab A into slot B, as one of my gay friends says. And those are less risky and probably better to stick to, at least during the early stages. The other thing that a lot of people do is what's called fluid bonding, which is a very common arrangement in, in poly circles, where when you're in what you think will be a long-term committed relationship, the two of you get tested, and when you test clean, you agree that you'll have unprotected sex with one another, but sex with all your outside partners needs to be protected with barriers. And then if a barrier fails, then you have to go through the six-month thing again while you wait to make sure you're both clean. That's the commonest arrangement, and you really have to do, you know, I, I'm not big into saying have to about poly. I think people can do pretty much what they want. But one of the things you have to do is decide for yourself what the risks are and how to protect yourself. One of the real rules of poly, um, and again, I'm not big on the rules, but one of the rules of poly is that in terms of sexual health, the more conservative person wins. You don't get to try to argue a person down from their own standards of safety. You have to go with the more conservative. Right. That makes sense. And I think an important point you brought up is you have to understand what kind of risk you're comfortable with. A lot of people maybe don't kind of ignore the topic and they don't think about it too much. Yeah, that's what you don't get to do. Uh, you have to go do the homework on the kinds of sex you like to have and what the risks are and decide what you personally are okay with. And then if it turns out that the person you're hot for is comfortable with something a little less than you're comfortable with, then they win. You go with their standards, not yours. 
if there's a kind of sex that doesn't do anything for you, then for God's sake, don't have it. <laughs> and don't worry about those risks. You know, if, if you're not personally into anal, then don't do it. It's pretty high risk, in fact, very high risk. And there's no reason why you should take the risk unless it's something you like. But you know, speaking universal, you what kinds of sex do it for you. And you need to know what you're, what risks you're paying in exchange for having those kinds of sex. So we've come across the topic a little bit about boundaries, and you discuss that. That's a topic that comes up a lot when people are talking about this. It comes up a, a more so in relationships now. But why is it that boundaries become more important in polyamorous relationships? Um, because there's stuff pushing up against them all the time. Um, the more people you interact with, the more, if you picture each person as a person with a bubble around them that's things that are mine and things that are yours. If you're monogamous, those bubbles are only touching at one point, but if you're poly, they're touching at three or four or 20 points. And you have to manage all of those boundaries. Each person that you interact with is going to want things that wouldn't have occurred to you to want, and you're going to have to decide if you're okay with them or not and to what degree you're okay with them. That's, that's what we mean when we say boundaries. And the choice to be poly is the choice to work those boundaries with more than one person. A typical model that men use today is that they'll be polyamorous without telling the women or being very, uh, how would you say, like very discreet about it. They don't, they don't talk about it much. Do you see that a lot in polyamorous circles where people come in and, and then they're doing it in a different way? Or have you got commentary on that? Well, um, one of the places that Dossie and I differ a little bit from... Uh, some other poly educators is, in general, the, the received wisdom in poly is that don't ask, don't tell relationships, don't work very well. My own experience is that I have seen them work, and I don't argue with things that seem to be working. So if don't ask, don't tell is working, then fine blessings on you. I, I think it's cutting yourself off from some very strong connections. I think being friends with your lover's lover's can be extraordinarily fabulous. You know, some of the dearest people in my life are people that I met because they were lovers of one of my lovers. More than the sex, that's what really draws me to Polly is that possibility of community that you lose when you do don't ask, don't tell. Right. Do you feel also that it limits the relationship with that person? Because you're kind of saying these are areas of our lives that are secret. Yeah, it's a little bit like being in the closet. When you have other lovers that you can't talk about, you have to sort of self-censor all the time. Remember, oh, wait, did I, did I tell him about this? Or am I supposed to be being quiet about this? Um, if I talk about the movie I saw the other day, is he going to ask who I saw it with? And then I'm going to have to talk about something I don't want to talk about. It's not a comfortable, relaxed way to be. I personally prefer to live a life where I don't have to do that. Right, right. And this is where the ethical part of the slut comes. I, uh, for me, I understood it's really about having healthy mindsets and behaviors towards polyamory and how you deal with it. Each pair of poly people has to decide between them how much disclosure they're comfortable with. And this is another issue that comes up a lot in polyamory is when one person wants to hear everything and another person wants to hear very little. How do you work that? It may be that one person gets to hear everything and the other person doesn't have to hear much. But when one person really loves to disclose, when it's, I, I, I saw a couple break up about this not too long ago. One half of the couple really loved to talk about what he had done with his other partners. And the other half of the couple really hated hearing about that. And they couldn't find their way around that. So that was the thing that ended uh, a relationship. That's kind of interesting. How do you see polyamorous relationships end the most often? Is that the typical scenario or... They end for about the same reasons that monogamous relationships end most of the time. <laughs> My last long-term poly relationship ended primarily around issues of money and work, which, you know, that, that ends monogamous relationships too, a uh, lot. It's great to hear. You guys are human too. Yeah, 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 exactly. We, <laughs> we fight about housework like you do. We fight about, well, I'm assuming you're monogamous here. We fight about housework like monogamous people do. We, we fight about um, child rearing. We fight about pets. We fight about all sorts of things. The things that monogamous people don't necessarily have to fight about are things like, I have a date for Tuesday night and you made arrangements that require that you use the car. How do I get to my date? Blow out fight with a partner once because I was having sex with another partner in the bedroom and he had forgotten to get his bedroom slippers out first and his feet were cold and he was 
sitting outside the bedroom feeling left off and with his feet cold and getting poutier and poutier about it. And then by the time we came out, he had worked up a good old mad and we had a big fight. You know, that's not a problem that mainstream people have much, but it's the kind of thing that comes up in Bali. So in terms of like, we've talked a little bit about like some people might just feel that they're this way inclined or they want to experiment with it. Um, what, what would you say you, you know, people can learn from polyamory as opposed to normal relationships? What kind of upside is there in terms of experience? And, oh, huge. You know, just experience of life and relationships. Huge things to be learned from poly. One of the comments we get most about the ethical slut is that this isn't necessarily just a book for polyamorous people. This Everybody could learn things from this book. And we really think it's true. We just think that there's plenty of other good books about how to be monogamous, and we don't need to recover that ground. However, things like not making assumptions about what's been agreed to and what hasn't, that's a poly skill. Things like manipulating boundaries. Um, what is um, manipulating boundaries? Oh, um, I, I should say managing boundaries. Um, handling what you want and what you don't want as opposed to what the next person wants and doesn't want. Um, how do you work that when multiple people and multiple needs are all around you and sometimes they're in conflict with one another? That's what I meant. Managing the needs of multiple people without losing yourself in their needs. Yeah. Well, I think a very typical scenario that I've come across many times is where the other person isn't happy with your boundaries and so they'll push against your boundaries constantly. For example, you're, multi, you're polyamorous and they're, they want to be exclusive monogamous, or it could be the other way around. Is that one of the very common where people have kind of acknowledged what the boundaries are, but they're not going to stick with it and they tend to keep pushing because, you know, it's in their nature. They actually want it some other way. And is the better decision to say, okay, well, this is just not going to be a good relationship. So which kind of things do you see go down a lot and which way do you advise people to deal with that? It's very common. In fact, I'd say it's almost universal that when uh, two people decide to go into poly together, there's going to be one that's the more adventurous person and one that's the more conservative person. Often the, the male is the more adventurous person and the female is the less adventurous person in a hetero relationship, but that's not universal by any means. And my rule of thumb is that if you're working it right, if the agreement is right, the adventurous person should be feeling like they're being held back a little bit from where they want to go and the conservative person should be feeling like they're being stretched a little bit. So everybody should be a little uncomfortable, but within their tolerability range. One person being constricted, one person being stretched, and both of them a little uncomfortable, but okay. That's what I call it. Good agreement. So that brings up, like, going back to something we were talking about a second ago, is that polyamorous relationships are actually going to can't have the opportunity to help you to grow in ways that you didn't think of because you're entering into relationships with people who are a bit more open and they're going to be used to or want things that you're not used to and tend to push you a little bit to be open towards that and testing it. Is this one of the main reasons it has the ability to let you grow more and experience potentially a bit more about life and relationships in general? Absolutely. If you walk into a relationship with the assumption that if anything in this makes me uncomfortable, the other person will change for my comfort which is really what we're saying when we say monogamy in many cases, then we never learn how to survive that kind of discomfort. One of the things I love about being poly is if you want to know what you don't like about yourself, experience jealousy a few times, see what triggers it, and there you have the roadmap of what you don't like about yourself every time. Do you still get jealous? Just taking you as an example because you've been... There's little in my life right now to trigger jealousy, but... If there were, uh, yeah, of course. So it's not something you can work out completely? It's something you can get better at. I think if something triggered my jealousy now, I would have a, a really extensive toolkit for dealing with that that I didn't have uh, 20 or 30 years ago when I first started being poly. Because I've survived jealousy so many times that I now know how to handle it a lot better. That said, um, it's still going to come up. I just had coffee the other day with a woman friend who's been poly for a million years and her spouse is in a new relationship. And for some reason, this one is triggering her in a way that none of the others have done. And she's really struggling. And in her case, it had to do with some feelings about aging and some things she hated about aging and the fact that the new partner is young. There it goes again. You know, what, what is it you're not liking about your life? See what triggers your jealousy. Unfortunately, aging is not something we get to opt out of except for suicide, which is not a good solution. <laughs>
Not yet. There are there are some people working on yeah. it. Who knows? Yeah, I know, and I've, I've talked to some of them, and I have mixed emotions about that, but that's a different interview. Yeah, definitely. So we've had porn stars on, on this podcast before. Uh, Marcus London, you may have heard of him, and um, he didn't seem like he got jealous because, uh, you know, obviously they're very polyamorous in their traditional relationships, but it seemed like his wife did sometimes. Is that a typical dynamic? The females tend to get more jealous? No, it really can vary. Can the females be very non-jealous? I might be, again, assuming heterosexual relationships, I might be willing to generalize that men's jealousy is more often territorial and women's is more often insecure. There have actually been some studies showing that men are more likely to get jealous when a woman is sexual with someone else and women are more likely to get jealous when a man is emotionally intimate with someone else. So to me, that points to territoriality versus insecurity. Right. And that fits with your whole evolutionary psychology. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of evolutionary psychology, so you're going to have a fight with me if we try to go there. But we're, that's the way we've been in culture. It's everything about traditional male-female relationships has a long, long history of property. And that's not a thing that we overcome in a century. It's built into the culture. It's built into the fairy tales we read when we were kids. It's built into the language. We just can't get past it that fast. So it's not surprising that men and women would split along that line. It's just something to be aware of and to work on. Some people are more prone to jealousy and some less. I was just reading a Facebook friend of mine who was talking about watching a sad movie with her spouse, and she was sniffling and blowing her nose and crying, and he was looking at her like she was insane. Uh, Some people are more prone to that kind of crying in the movies than other people are. And in the same way, some people are more prone to stumble over jealousy often and other people just don't very much. I think, like, well, I'll just bring up my kind of my interesting experience. Maybe you'll be able to relate to it or maybe I'm strange. I don't know. <laughs> when I've been in multiple relationships for a while, for me, just because I don't want to be a hypocrite, I kind of turn that, I seem to be able to just turn that side off of me, especially if I've been the one who's kind of set the rules and if the girls kind of like just accepted them, then I haven't really, I haven't had a problem with jealousy. But Sometimes if you put it in the other scenario where you're exclusive, then I can get triggered by these kind of feelings. And it seems like it's based on the way I'm looking at the relationship and the way I've looked at it. I don't, is that something common for men or for women that it depends on the type of relationship they have? Yeah, it's a matter of expectation. If you're in a relationship where there's an expectation of a particular kind of availability, then finding out that that's not necessarily the case is likely to be a jealousy trigger. So if you've been expecting you guys are going to sleep in the same bed every night, to take one that people often do expect, and then it turns out that, no, some nights she's going to go be in somebody else's bed, then, yeah, you might get a little triggered, and you're going to have to talk about that, figure out if there's an agreement that needs to be made. Yeah. So, again, it comes back down to expectations. So it seems like you link the whole idea of jealousy, you're linking it to expectations have been broken in some way so would like better communication and and the things we've been talking about like discussing boundaries ahead of time that they compensate for jealousy a lot of the time you can forestall uh, that kind of problem most of the time there will be times you know we call them landmines where sometimes something is going to happen that you thought that you had an expectation about it turns out they didn't realize there was an expectation there that's when you have to sit down and discuss it Some of the fights happen, or it may just be that, well, gee, I didn't know you expected that. Yeah, that's not a problem. Let's do it that way. So you're talking about fights, uh, and obviously in your book it comes across as more healthy, and it kind of should avoid having arguments, and you should sit down and talk about things. How does it tend to be for most people in these situations? Is there still lots of people fighting and shouting a lot, or have a lot of people come to terms with discussing these things more calmly? It's just a matter of, to a large degree, cultural background the fighting skill that people have learned along the way that they saw modeled for them growing up. In some families, there's a lot of shouting and slamming of doors and general loudness and abruptness and and harshness. And that doesn't mean violence by any means. It just means a different way of expressing disagreement. And in others, it's very common reason. There can be problems when there's a mismatch there. There can be big problems when there's a mismatch there. But they're they're all communication styles, and it's just a matter of finding ones that work. I'm very WASP, very conflict-averse, very calm person. I don't lose my temper easily. So my arguing style tends to be a certain amount of crying, but (laughs) (laughs) a a lot of uh, rational talk. That's an interesting one, crying. Can it sometimes be uh, emotionally manipulative? Like a response, like when when the argument comes up, you start crying, and then 
it's conjuring up a situation in the relationship. I don't think it's usually meant, in my case, I know it's not meant to be emotionally manipulative. It's just when women, again, in cultured, uh, get overwhelmed with emotion, it tends to come out our eyes, just like too much to hold. And so that's where it comes out. Men, more often, it comes out with banging things and yelling things and, and being loud. But it's it's the same thing. It's just too much emotion to hold at the time. So is there anyone that shouldn't do this? Like, would you say, are there people that you would say, oh, polyamory is not for you? Or like, if you're thinking about it in certain ways, it's maybe not for you. Like, have you seen any kind of like, I don't know, darker side things that you maybe people would want to avoid? Um, if you're happy with your monogamous life, then poly isn't for you. There's no earthly reason you should try it unless you're drawn to it. It's a fair amount of work and a fair amount of social sanction. And, you know, why should you? If monogamy is working, then do monogamy, for God's sake. If you're not interested in a certain amount of self-examination, looking at what drives you and what upsets you and what you want and what you don't want, then you're not going to be very good at poly because uh, it asks for a lot of that. And some of what you find out may not be stuff that you like, and then you have to work on that, and it's a lot. So if if that is uncomfortable for you, it's probably best for you not to do poly. Well, the way you're talking about it right now sounds a lot like self-help, self-growth kind of. It, it know, can be. Doing work on yourself to make yourself better. But the fact that my co-author is a therapist and I'm a therapist kid comes off pretty comes out pretty strongly in our writing and speaking, I think. But yes, it certainly does have self-helpy issues. There's a lot of uh, overlap between the language of self-help and the language of poly. Because we're sometimes talking about poly reminds me a lot of the talking I do about SM in that we're consciously and intentionally going into things that we know are going to be difficult and making the commitment to get through them and to be stronger at the end. I think it's a great reason to be involved in it because I have certainly grown from mine. One of the reasons I don't do it anymore is because I found it very distracting. That's the other thing is if you have already a very busy and full life, there are genuine time commitments involved in poly that are not just the time you're spending in bed with all these different people. There's a lot of processing time, a lot of time that you want to spend with them not in bed so that they feel like you want them for something besides their genitals. It's a time commitment and an energy commitment. And if you're working on your doctoral dissertation, now may not be a good time for you to be poly. That's a great point. So I'd like to know a bit more about you uh, as a person. Is there any aspect of sexuality in relationships you've yet to explore or that you think you'd like to one day or, you know, anything like that that you haven't approached yet or maybe even write about? Well, um, as previously mentioned, I'm bearing down on my 60th birthday and I've spent the last 30 years of my life exploring sex as pretty much an avocation uh, and to some degree a vocation. So I pretty much have had my shot at the kinds of sex I want. They're, I can't right offhand think of anything that interests me that I haven't tried. Certainly, if something were to come up, then I would go try it. But as I sit here right now, I can't think of anything that I am yearning to do that I haven't had a shot at doing. That's great. It sounds like satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not unhappy about it. <laughs> what was uh, your worst experience over those 30 years? Or, or your best experience? You've got a couple of examples of you know things that you thought were particularly great. And... Oh, God, so many lovely experiences. Um, it's hard to pick out the good ones. Uh, the, the bad ones... Or the one that changed you the most, or, you know... There's one, I've written about it, and it'll be in the new book, but uh, I haven't, it hasn't been in a book yet. When Dossie and I were working on our most recent book, which is a book called Radical Ecstasy, uh, which is about the spiritual aspects of BDSM, we were exploring Tantra together. And in the process of exploring Tantra together um, at a workshop, I had what some people call a Kundalini awakening, where I was overwhelmed by the energy and swept up and out of control and screaming and just utterly out of myself. And it changed everything, which, again, that's a subject for a whole other interview. I could talk for hours about the things that's changed. But that was the thing that changed everything for me. And I don't even know whether to call it one of the best experiences or the worst because it was both. Okay, great. And so that was tantric sex and, and kundalini? 
what most people would call sex. We were sitting in each other's laps and breathing together. Sure, sure. Like so, if that looks like sex to you, then... <laughs> right, 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 right. Like tantra is a bit of a wide area. Yeah. That's uh, interesting. I actually did read uh, your article you wrote on that, which I found interesting. Uh, I'm hoping to write about it at more length in the new book. Yeah, it sounds like a very a big marker in your life. <laughs> um, what is your greatest conflict? Is there any conflicts in this area of your life, relationships and sex, that you haven't managed to resolve over time? The kind of war is there. This is going to sound terribly mundane, but what have I paid for this life of mine? Before I started down this path, I was an advertising copywriter on my way to becoming a creative director. If I had stayed on that path, I would probably have a whole lot more money than I do now. Whereas now the the mundane issues of money and housing and all of that are still an ongoing struggle in my life as I move on from middle age into old age. And, you know, I don't know any sex educators who have gotten wealthy doing it. We just don't. So that would be the conflict for me is the fact that following this path, which I think has been terribly important and I'm glad I did it. And a lot of other people are glad I did it, but that's what, that's what I take for it. Yeah, great. I mean, like, there's, it's an endless debate. I left a corporate career in management consulting to do to do other stuff. I made the same decision, and I'm you know happy with it. And other people will sit on the other different sides, and they'll they'll always look at the grass is greener over the other side. So um, often, I think most people kind of wish they took your route, the creative route, at the end of the day. So I know you're working on your book now. Is there anything particularly exciting about that um, for you? The writing is hard and glorious. Um, I'm trying to keep it at the highest possible level. Like there's a lot of sort of dominatrix memoirs coming out right now, and I'm not really interested in writing another one. So I'm, I'm not interested in doing the kind of book that's, well, then I beat this guy, and then I fuck this other guy. And uh, I, I'm trying to write about the essence of what BDSM did for me and why I did it. And that's hard stuff because nobody really understands uh, why we do BDSM. We just do. Some of us are drawn very strongly to it. Uh, for no reason that anybody knows. And I'm trying to sort of get at those reasons, which will not have anything to do with anybody but me, but get at the reasons for me. And that's really hard, really inward work that I can only do for a little while at a time. That sounds very interesting. Who besides, you actually mentioned a few people already earlier in the interview, but I was wondering who besides yourself would you recommend for high quality advice in this area? Polyagamy, polyamory. Polyamory, polyagony, I like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I said po- poly, polyagony, but uh, different yeah, pronunciation. That's, uh, Freudian. Or maybe um, it was a Freudian <laughs> slip, who knows? <laughs> well, I, I think I mentioned um, Tristan Tarmino's opening up is very highly regarded. Jenny Block did a, a good memoir, for, especially for people who are living a fairly conventional life and still drawn to poly. Her memoir is about being sort of a conventional wife and mom, getting into poly from that viewpoint. And Dossie and I have been sort of dropouts from mainstream culture for many years, but Jenny wasn't and isn't. Uh, Likewise, Pamela Madsen's book, Shameless, is a fabulous book about exploring the outer realms of sexuality while maintaining a core relationship. I have not read Elizabeth Sheff's The Polyamorist Next Door, uh, but from everything I've heard about it, it's terrific, and I think it's a badly needed book to start talking about how people actually implement polyamory in their own lives. Um, Wendy O'Maddox, Redefining Our Relationships, Anthony Ravenscroft, Polyamory for the Clueless and Hopeful. You know, there's a lot now. Yeah, there's a great list there. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so the last question, we ask everyone this. Oh, Deborah, Deborah Annapol's classic books, I, sh- I should mention. Deborah wrote the first poly book, which was at that time called Love Without Limits. And I think now it's called um, Polyamory, The New Love Without Limits. Uh, Hers is more about the kind of poly where multiple people live together for a long period of time. So it's kind of a specific model of polyamory, but it's really good about that. Great. Great. Thank you for this. What would be your top three recommendations to men to help them if they're interested in this area or, you know, polyamory, or maybe they're already involved in it, but how, how could they improve it? What would be the kind of recommendations you would make to them? I can't remember who I'm quoting when I talk about the radical proposal that women are human beings. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's a sort of classic feminist quote. The men I see who make themselves unpopular in poly circles are the ones who don't open themselves to connection, who are in it for the status of lots of notches on the bedpost or the status of 
banging the hottest chick in the room um, instead of the vulnerability of opening yourself to different people. I think uh, any sex that you have from ego is not going to be very good sex. Sex is about vulnerability and ego is about invulnerability. That's a very self-helpy recommendation, but that's really my recommendation for men who are getting into into poly is to come into it with as much openness and humbleness and vulnerability as you can, which does not mean losing yourself in any way. It means being yourself as much as you can. That's a great quote. I never heard anyone call the ego uh, about being invulnerable before, but it makes total sense. That's a great way to put it. Thank you very much for those, uh, Janet. It's been a really great discussion. I've enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah, thanks for making the time to go on the show. Absolutely. Will you send me the link when it's up? Of course. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Adel. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take control of your dating life today. Take one idea or one insight from today's episode and apply it today. Don't wait. Do it today. That's all it takes to change your life step-by-step episode by episode. Learn more about what I, Angel Donovan, and my team do at DatingSkillsReview.com. How we help men like you take control of their dating lives.